With that, we move on to our second speaker, it, Liz Jackson Whithorn from Ryerson University. Liz will be speaking to us today on dilemmas, disagreement, and dualism. Liz, it's all yours. All right, awesome. Let me try to share this. Uh, let's see. Can everyone see that? Perfect, that's good. Okay, awesome, great. So I am going to jump right in because I have 10 minutes and that's very quick. And the first time I tried to give this, I think it was 30. So, but I think I've got it down to 10. So uh, hopefully we can keep it there. So we're gonna go back to the old school. This is like the old school disagreement question. Um, and that old school disagreement question is, what should you do when someone who is smart and well-informed disagrees with you? And just, um, you know, as a very kind of simplistic way of thinking about two options, um, conciliationists say that we should change our opinions in some ways, and steadfasters say we should sort of hold fast to our previous opinion. So uh, central to kind of this debate is a concept probably very familiar to many of you, and that's the concept of an epistemic peer. And this is roughly someone who's kind of epistemically on a par with you. So they probably have similar evidence, similar epistemic virtues, uh, you know, similar liability, uh, maybe they're similarly free from bias, that kind of thing. So one way you can kind of see this question is, should you alter your opinion when you encounter a disagreeing epistemic peer? And what I want to do today is sort of argue that we have a good reason to say both yes and no to this question. So this leads us to kind of an epistemic dilemma when we encounter peer disagreement. And then what I want to do is offer a solution to this dilemma uh, spoiler alert, that is that we should modify our credences, but not our beliefs when we encounter peer disagreement. And then I'm going to motivate the solution in two ways. The first has to do with contents and attitudes, and then the second has to do with the nature of epistemic peers. Okay, so first is the dilemma from disagreement. And this dilemma is based on the idea that both one and two on this slide have some kind of intuitive appeal. And this, may, this point is made uh, more extensively by a forthcoming paper by Laura Bouchak. Um, it's forthcoming in Phil Review. But the idea is that both one and two, there seems that they're getting at something true. Um, one says that our opinions should change in some way when we encounter peer disagreement. And this captures the intuition behind conciliationist views. And a very famous case is Christensen's restaurant case, where we're calculating how much of the bill, we're trying to split the bill, how much do we each owe at a restaurant? I get 42, you get 47. And it just doesn't seem appropriate for me to just say, well, I got 42, I'm right, you're wrong, like, sorry, <laughs> I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna change my opinion about what our share of the bill is. Uh, so the thought is, in general, it just seems kind of dogmatic and closed-minded to just ignore a peer's opinion and just to continue with the same opinion that we had before. Um, um, again, remember, this peer is someone who's reliable and has good evidence and is supposed to be kind of epistemically on a par with you. So there's some, intuition, there's some kind of intuitive appeal to this idea that we should change our opinions and we encounter peer disagreement. But at the same time, there's also intuitive appeal to this idea that our opinions shouldn't change when we encounter peer disagreement. And this is the intuition behind the steadfast views. Um, one very basic way of motiv motivating this is just the idea that it seems like we can rationally have strong opinions about controversial matters. Just because people disagree about something doesn't mean uh, it's irrational to have a strong opinion about it. At least there's, you know, there's some kind of, there's something intuitive about that thought. Um, related to this is the spinelessness worry, and Jamie Fritz has a nice paper where he talks about spinelessness and moral disagreement, but the idea is that if we just change our opinion whenever someone disagrees with us, there seems like something spineless about that. You're, you're giving up your opinion too quick. Um, and third, uh, there's a lot of epistemic benefits to disagreement, and a lot of research shows that disagreement in a group makes it more likely that that group will sort of converge on the truth in the long run. So there's, there's debate here whether you could kind of get those same benefits from sort of something like acceptance rather than um, straight up disagreement. But the idea is that there is a lot of epistemic benefits from sort of having a diversity of viewpoints within a group that we shouldn't ignore those. So in general, the thought is there's sort of something to be said for the idea that we should change our opinions when we encounter peer disagreement and something to be said for the idea that we shouldn't change our opinions when we encounter peer disagreement. Um, but, you know, one and two both can't be true at the same time. So what are we supposed to do? Um, and what I want to note is that opinion in one and two is actually ambiguous between two mental states. 
belief and credence. So beliefs are sort of coarse grained attitudes. Um, in, in a belief framework, there's three attitudes we can take towards a proposition. We can believe it, we can withhold on it, we can disbelieve it. Credences are much more fine grained attitudes. You can think about them as kind of like subjective probabilities or even confidence levels. And basically what they do is they give, uh, give your, your attitude towards a proposition a value on the scale from zero to one, where one sort of represents maximal confidence it's true, zero represents maximal confidence that it's false. So this view called belief credence dualism is the view that belief and credence are relatively independent mental states. We have both belief and credence and neither reduces to the other. In the paper, I say some things to motivate this view, but I have to skip that here. But the thought is, if we have both belief and credence, this sort of opens up the door for new options um, in the epistemology of disagreement. And the thought is, well, when we encounter a peer disagreement, we don't just have two options, we actually have four. We could change both our belief and credence, neither our belief nor our credence, just our belief but not our credence, and just our credence but not our belief. So what's interesting about these third and fourth options where we sort of change one attitude but not the other is that this enables us to capture the intuitions, at least in some sense, um, behind both the conciliationist view and the steadfast view. So we can acknowledge and give weight to our peers' dissenting opinion. We're not just saying, I'm right, you're wrong. But we also don't necessarily uh, you know, have spinelessness or a loss of these epistemic benefits. And I know that was really quick, but I think that's actually a really interesting reason to sort of endorse either option um, three or option four. And what I want to do now is sort of provide two reasons to prefer option four to option three. So prefer this idea that we should change our credences rather than our beliefs to the view that we should change our beliefs rather than our credences. And um, the, the bonus, so I'll provide two main options, but here's, here's a bonus reason to prefer four to three. Um, some of you might be familiar with the self-undermining problem for conciliationism. It's the idea that a lot of people disagree about conciliationism. So if you believe conciliationism, it seems um, like that would be irrational given the number of people that disagree with you about it. And the thought is if we change our credences but not our beliefs in response to disagreement, um, we can rationally believe conciliationism, we should just lower our credence in it. So if you sort of frame the self-undermining worry in terms of what we can rationally believe, that might give you a preliminary reason to sort of prefer option four to option three. Um, now I'm gonna talk about two more reasons to prefer option four. I have about three minutes, so I'm gonna try to go quickly. So the first um, is that it's just hard to see what conciliationism should look like in a belief framework. So let's suppose conciliationism is true. Um, in the very, very basic case, if you believe P and I believe not P, maybe we should both withhold belief on P. But what if you believe P and I withhold belief on P? Um, and it's not like I haven't thought about it, so I'm withholding. It's like, that's my settled opinion. I think that's the right response to sort of the evidence. Um, how should we conciliate in a belief framework? You know, and you might say, well, maybe we should both believe probably P, but that doesn't tell us what attitude we should take towards P. So in general, the tripartite belief framework just seems too coarse grained to capture even these basic cases of conciliationism. But credences, on the other hand, are much more fine grained than beliefs. And this allows us for a lot more flexibility when conciliating with a peer. Um, and credal conciliationism, that doesn't mean that we have to always, you know, split the difference with our peer or just average our credences either. But credences, because they're so flexible, they actually allow us to consider and potentially adopt a number of different rules, including, you know, conditionalization or um, the UPCO rule that East Warren and others propose. So it just gives us more flexibility in terms of how we should conciliate and what that should look like in different situations. All right, and then reason number two has to do with the nature of epistemic peerhood. So the problem here is um, actually, yeah, so there's a title of this paper by Nathan King and the title is A Good Peer is Hard to Find. So, so what does that mean? Well, Consider the conditions for being an epistemic peer. You're supposed to have basically the same evidence, basically the same reliability, maybe basically the same epistemic virtues. Um, just take the evidence condition. So finding someone who merely shares your evidence is hard enough, right? Um, we all come to the table with different background beliefs, different presuppositions, different experiences. So finding someone who, who, who shares your evidence is tough. Um, and, and King spells this out in a lot more detail and goes through different definitions of evidence. But 
that's just the evidence condition. I mean, think about reliability. I think a lot of people who we agree or disagree with in real life are probably either slightly more or slightly less reliable than us. Um, they're probably slightly more, slightly less epistemically virtuous than us, uh, maybe slightly more, slightly less biased than us, etc. So you might think this is a problem, but I don't actually think it's a deep problem. And I don't think it means that, like, for example, conciliationism is never appropriate. I think it just means we have to conciliate in kind of a more nuanced way. So if your peer, or sorry, not your peer, but if your disagreeer is maybe slightly more reliable than you, or has slightly better evidence, that doesn't mean you shouldn't conciliate. In fact, it means you should just conciliate a little bit more, right? And if your peer is slightly less reliable than you, or has slightly worse evidence, but still reliable to an extent, you should probably conciliate too, if conciliationism is true, just slightly less. Um, and then if you disagree with an expert, maybe you should defer to them, or at least mostly defer. And if you disagree with a novice, maybe you should you know, disregard their opinion or mostly disregard their opinion. So conciliationism doesn't at all depend on the existence of these sort of perfect idealized epistemic peers. Um, and I think how much we should conciliate should just depend on the extent to which someone who disagrees with us is a peer or not. But again, the problem is the belief framework is just way too coarse grained to capture these differences and sort of levels of disagreeers or levels of peerhood. So we need an attitude that's more fine grained and flexible. And that's where credences come in. So not only do credences enable us to capture a variety of different updating rules, they also enable us to sort of conciliate with, um, with a, a wide variety of different disagreeers. Um, I have two objections, I'll skip those. Maybe they'll come up in Q&A and that's it. Those are my references. Thank you so much, Liz. Same kudos goes to you. As to Mark, thank you for sticking within the 10 minutes. At this point, I pass to Breno for running the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Liz. Uh, we have a question for Kulja in the, in the Q&A, who asks, uh, how does dualism connect to right action? That is, do you act on expected utility calculated by your credence, or do you act on your beliefs? I'm especially curious about this in the context of disagreement about the moral status of some action. Uh, some action you're about to do or not to do. For example, tweet the article on, on you only read one, one fourth of it. Uh, sorry, what was that last sentence? Uh, I'm especially curious about, about this in the context of disagreement about the moral status of, status of some action you're about to do or not to do. For example, tweet the article, you only read one fourth of it. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, no, this is a this is a really interesting question, um, and I think I can't do justice to it uh, in the five minutes we have here, even if I literally talk for the whole five minutes. So it kind of comes uh, comes back to this question, which I think is related. It's just a challenge that dualists have to deal with, and um, it's it's been called the Bayesian challenge, which is why did we have both beliefs and credences? If you have a belief in P and a credence in P with the same content you know, why would we have both? Like that just seems to kind of be multiplying entities, uh, you know, beyond necessity, right? So I think what the answer to this is gonna depend on what is that role that belief is playing that credence isn't playing? And what is that role that credence is playing? Thank you, I wasn't sure if I should stop sharing or not. Uh, what is that role that credence is playing that belief isn't playing? So the answer you give to that is gonna kind of change, like change the answer to this question overall. But some people think that, um, so Laura Bushak, for example, thinks that beliefs have a really important to ro role to play in our practices of praise and blame that credences can't play. And that might be actually really related to our moral judgments. So it might be that there are certain situations where you should actually act on like your belief someone is blameworthy rather than your credence. And Laura gives a bunch of evidence from like legal cases and uh, just kind of our general practices of praising and blaming people that um, beliefs have this important role a related role too is just the act of needing to take a stand on something. Um, you know, you're taking a stand on something that's important to you. And some people think a high credence just can't play that role. That's a role that belief needs to play. So, so answering this question fully would require like spelling out these roles in detail and then saying, when do we act on, you know, this belief that eating meat is morally bad? And when do we act on this credence? And then what role does that have to play in decision theory? And in some ways I'm sympathetic to the picture given by Ross and Schroeder there. Um, sorry, I know I'm saying a lot of stuff that's because I think this is actually kind of a complex and really interesting question. That's probably a whole other paper or multiple papers. Um, but yeah, so, so the basic answer is you're going to need to give a story about the role for belief 
and maybe the, the role that belief plays sort of in our, in our moral judgments and how that relates to action. And I, and I, think, I think we can give a satisfactory account there, but I acknowledge it's going to be complex. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question for Dunian who asks, uh, do you take higher or order evidence to have a different impact on beliefs slash credences in the context of peer disagreement? Uh, that's in, so sorry. A, a bigger impact on beliefs rather than credences. Slash credences, is slash credences belief slash credences. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I haven't thought about that a lot. I mean, I guess insofar as you might think disagreement is higher order evidence, and then if you buy my view where we should modify our credences but not our beliefs in response to disagreement, maybe you could get a view on which higher order evidence affects credences more than beliefs. Um, but I don't actually know if I have that view of disagreement, that disagreement is functions as higher order evidence. So I think I would just need to think more about that. But that's that's a really interesting point because I know that is kind of a common view uh, among certain steadfasters. So good question. Uh, next question for Filippi who asks, would the, would the credence model have the same advantages if we are thinking about cases of systematic disagreement? I think it's related to the, next, to the last one. Hmm. Uh, it would have the same advantages in that it could capture both the intuitions behind steadfast and conciliationist views. I don't know if I fully see why. Um, if if we're so say it one more time. I'm trying to look at the chat. Uh, in the Q and A, uh, would the credence model have the same advantages uh, if you if we are thinking about cases of systematic disagreement? Oh, if we aren't or are? Are. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I did want to say something about systematic disagreement and what my view might say about that. I, I don't know if I would, I fully see why it would have the same advantages. I think I would just need to hear more about that. But I do think there's an interesting question, like, what should we do, like, maybe an iterated disagreement if someone keeps disagreeing with you? And I think there's at least two options. So option one would be, um, so I, I talked about belief credence dualism, right? That's a descriptive thesis. That's about uh, whether belief reduces to credence or credence reduces to belief. A separate view, it's a normative thesis called the Lockean thesis, and that's whether rational belief requires rational credence above some threshold. And I actually want my picture uh, to be able to be combined with the Lockean thesis or combined with views that reject the Lockean thesis, so I want to remain neutral on that. So if you accept the Lockean thesis, you're gonna get this steadfastness, but only to a point. Once your credence goes below that threshold, then you're gonna be required to give up your belief. So I guess the benefit of this view is that it has, it, it can capture this idea that normatively, belief and high credence seem to go together. But I guess the downside of this view is that steadfasters might not be as happy with it because you should give up your belief at least after you encounter so many disagreeers that your credence gets so low. Um, the more controversial way of sort of spelling out my view would be to deny the Lockean thesis and to say, actually, there are cases where you could rationally believe something, but even have like a lowish credence in it. And then how low just, you know, there, there'd be different views on how low you might not have to say like 0.1, but you know, you could say, uh, you know, maybe I start up believing P and you start up believing not P and we both end up actually having the same credence in P, even though I keep believing P and you keep believing not P. That, that's a possibility. Um, I, I kind of want to remain neutral here. Maybe I should take a, a stronger stance, but it's going to depend on how concerned you are with uh, kind of capturing these intuitions behind steadfastness. So. Thanks so much, Liz. I, I want to point out something that I should have also pointed out with respect to Mark, and that is there are many questions in the Q&A that we did not have a chance to get to. There are also questions in the chat that we didn't have a chance to get to. Have a look at those. Um, if you don't get to them today, don't worry. We always save them and they show up on our uh, on the the, um, the website afterwards. Uh, at this point, we go to our third and final speaker.